Take your scriptures, and we are going to go back to Ephesians chapter 6. And the last few weeks, I have been on a series of teachings uh, that has been more of a focus on spiritual warfare, but we've called it the unseen realm. And we spent considerable time talking about a, a paradigm for living that I believe the Lord wants us to live in. And I had been sharing how I believe that the emphasis upon the ascension of Christ and the revelation in the ascension has been a neglected truth. And so we do not want to de-emphasize the power of the cross, what it's accomplished, what was demonstrated through the resurrection. But I do believe the Holy Spirit is going to expressly begin to emphasize to the church this, this third dimension of the work of Christ uh, because each one of these events in the life of Jesus is a revelation to us. There is, there is divine revelation that the Lord wants to impart to us uh, uh, about what was accomplished in the cross, the resurrection, but the ascension reveals to us the ongoing life experience of Jesus and how we are invited to partner with him, participate, partake in his ongoing life. And his ongoing life is that he is a king and he is a priest. And he's invited us as a royal priesthood, a holy aristocracy, I could say, because we are king and priest with him, co-ruling, co-reigning. And so I kept emphasizing that teaching that even though we live here, because he's there and we're in him and he is in us, we're able to live in two realities at one time, two realms at one time. And I keep saying, I can't explain that with human words. I cannot articulate it clearly. It's just a revelation and we have to catch that revelation. And I believe that when we allow the Holy Spirit to reveal to us truth, the truth of God's word, what, what it is, it, it is caught by us and then understanding comes after. Okay, we believe, we receive, and then our understanding becomes fruitful. And so the Lord wants us to live as if we are ascended with him. We have been raised with him and we have been seated with him knowing that he's resurrected, but he's also reigning. But then I began to talk about how that because we are reigning with him and we are seated with him, we have been given not only priestly responsibilities, but we've been given kingdom authority. And that authority has been, uh, it is, is given to us, delegated to us, so that we learn to use that authority, and primarily it has two expressions. Number one, we are to unlock things that heaven desires to release in the earth. So since I'm not, you know, since, since I am bilocational, I'm in heaven, but also on the earth, I'm seated with him, I am one spirit with the Lord that allows me to have access to all that heaven is and all the resources and all that the kingdom is. I'm able to be granted access. And the Lord says, I want you to use your kingly authority now to release on earth what heaven needs or what earth needs. Then I also want you to restrict and I want you to bind things that are upon the earth and in the earth that is a part of the, the curse, the result of the fall, and then how the enemy is able to leverage uh, our fall and the sin that we engaged in, how he's able to, uh, to, to leverage that to enslave the human race and to bring us into slavery and bondage. And so he said, I want you to be a liberator. I want you to go declare my kingdom. I want you to exhibit it. I want you to demonstrate its power and its glory in the earth. And I want you to prevail against portals of hell, strongholds of hell. I want you to break the power of the enemy. And the way 
the power of the enemy is broken, as we as the body of Christ mature, we, we begin to understand the weaponry of our warfare and we effectively know how to use it. And as we mature, and this is where we left off last week, when the church grows and mature in a likeness of stature that's like Christ, what is happening, happening in the realm of the spirit is that principalities and powers are being displaced. Because Ephesians 1, Ephesians 1 tells us that as Christ and his glory is increased in us, the church begins to be the expression of the fullness of him that fills everything everywhere. How many believe there is, there is an increase of his government going on right now? He's carrying the weight and the, the yoke and the burden of the entire kingdom of God. You go, is it a heavy yoke? No, it fits him. He is ruling in righteousness and with great glory and power. He's the only one qualified to be the king of the universe who has authority over everything in the heavens and over everything in the earth. But you need to understand that this government is, is not going to, at any moment in time, is ever going to be diminished or decreased. It's only going to continue to increase. And so that's why we pray, let your kingdom come and your will would be done. I want to see in me today his kingdom increase. I want to see the rule of my king increase in me. And so there is this battlefield that you and I are, are in the midst of, and it's called the battlefield earth. Satan, having been limited in scope because he's been cast down, and it says with great rage he wants to intensify his warfare on the earth and against those that have the testimony of Jesus. But it says that we overcome him by what? The blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. But then there's this third dimension that I think is a true statement of where the Lord is wanting to take us into maturity. That we learn not to love our life. We're not trying to preserve it, trying to save it, not trying to live our own life independently of the king and his kingdom. But even if it costs us our life, we will live for Christ and we will be willing to die for Christ. And when we have those three weapons of our warfare working all together, the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and us being free from self-preservation and self-centeredness, there is going to be a prevailing church. Now, where we left off last week, and we are going to read the text. Don't worry, I'm going to get there. I just said that the essence of spiritual warfare is who defines reality. That's what the battle on this planet is all about right now. Whether darkness will define reality or whether the word of God defines reality. And we call Satan a great illusionist because even though he's been uh, defeated, and his head has been crushed, and his, the outcome of his total absolute collapse of his kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, is assured he still is an illusionist and projects an image that he's still in control. And so what he does is he tries to project illusions of darkness and deception to try to define reality. But God has another narrative and another story for this planet. I appreciate the one or two men. Hey, Amen. So I'm going to say it again. God has a different story and a narrative for this planet. Guys, it's not going to continue the way it's, it's been for a long time. It's not just going to progressively get worse and worse and worse. And then uh, the second coming is going to be about a hostage rescue. It is not. There will be a radiant, glorious church that will be, that she will have fought many battles and she will bear scars, but she will be victorious. And when the king comes, it is going to be for a radiant, militant, and victorious church. 
She will be tried in fire. There will be many martyrs. I understand all of that. You can't read the book of Revelation without seeing the glory, but also the, 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 the battle that will rage around us. But make no mistake about it. The consummation is going to be about Jesus receiving the fullness of what he died for. And so our job is to break the illusion that things are going to continue as they've always been and the devil is going to, to increase his clutch of power on this planet. Jesus has a different plan. However, what the power of the enemy does with deception is he gets society to agree upon and establish through our consent or our compromise or our engagement in habits of disobedience, he then begins through, again, consent, compromise, habitual use. And when we agree with him and we give him pathways into our heart and mind, he is ultimately able to define reality. And so what we have to do as the people of God, we have to ask the Holy Spirit to show us what agreements we've made with the powers of darkness. And so, whether it's an institution, whether it's a church, whether it's a city, whether it's a region, no matter what it is, the people that, that are, have been given authority to oversee those things or to have places of authority in those spheres, they can either be agreeing with the power of deception they can be agreeing with the lies of the enemy. They can, they can allow themselves to come in alignment with the kingdom of darkness. And then they compromise by saying, okay, uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and just go ahead and, and live at this level. I'm going to, I always say compromise is our decision to say, I'm just going to try to survive this and really not overcome this. And so the enemy gets us to agree. He gets us to consent, to accept this is the way it is. I'm going to be a little prophetic. I'm going to preach prophetically this morning. I need you as the body of Christ in the Cooley region. I need you as spiritual leaders. I need you as men and women of God, sons and daughters of God, to stand up with one voice and one accord that we say we no longer consent to the rule of darkness over our region. We do not consent. We will not allow you to browbeat us down and to accuse us and to lay a charge against us and to try to cause us to believe something about ourselves that is not in alignment with the truth. We say we will not consent any longer. We're not going to negotiate a settlement that allows for coexistence in this land. We say his kingdom come, his will is going to be done in this region just like it is in heaven. Jesus does not endure a vote every day in heaven among the saints of God and the angel of God. Should he remain king? No, there is no negotiation. There is no democracy in heaven. There is no votes that are being cast whether Jesus is still going to be king. And that is the type of apostolic resolve that the Lord wants in his church in this hour and this day that we agree with Jesus as king. And the concept of what that is, he's not a ceremonial king. He's not just a king in name only. No, but in substance, in glory, and in power. And we say, we will have him and only him rule over us. Only Jesus. So we, we say we want to consent to heaven. We want to agree with heaven and we want to break off the spirit of compromise and then anything that the enemy would gain as access into our life through some type of, of habit or sin or pattern of sin we say lord we want that broken off of our lives but this is the point that i made last week and i'm going to just finish the re review and we're going to get into new material i said however 
even though the manifestation of the battle is occurring on the earth. The battle is decided. We will see the fruit and effect of of the victory of Christ being expressed through the church in the earth. But really, the battle is decided in the heavenlies. We see breakthrough in the earth realm. We will see it in churches. We'll see it in cities. We'll see it in nations. So as we pray today that God would change the spiritual climate in the nation of Zimbabwe and then also change the natural climate, You go, I don't believe the church has the power to do that. Well, I just want to encourage you to begin to study the power of prayer and how the the prayer of righteous people, even though, uh, you know, it says that Elijah had like passions. I mean, he was a human being that, that was weak in moments and then other times he appeared spiritually strong, but, you know, he had his ups and downs, but it said that man prayed effectual, fervent prayers And when he prayed prayers, he had the power of his prayer shut the heavens and open the heavens to to cause the heavens not to rain and then to rain to come. If that man who had ups and downs in his spiritual life but could pray fervently prayers of faith that would change the natural climate of Israel in his day, I believe those that are born again, baptized in the Spirit of God. He was an Old Testament prophet. What more power do we have today if we only knew the power of prayer. So I want us to start praying like you have power. It's not just the methodology of prayer. It is the substance of what we believe uh, about prayer and how effective it can be. So I believe the battle is decided uh, not on the earth, but it is in the heavenlies. And so those who rule in the heavenlies govern over the earthly and so I've been trying to encourage us live with a heavenly perspective live with an ascension paradigm understand that that where he sits is the seat of your authority and that from that place you can wield that authority effectively to change things in a substantive way in the earth now I wanted us to read this text, and I want you to go with me, and you're already there, and I'm not there yet, but I'm going to get there. We're going to read this text again that we've been working through, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. He said, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So when we come against what We described last week of what we're coming up against. This is not in our own strength, our own power. This is not about us going, hey, we can do this. We can do this. You know, it's not about us coming together and and giving ourselves a pep pep talk and then run out onto the battlefield. This is is knowing where our strength lies. We only are going to be able to do what God says is wanting to equip us to do in spiritual warfare if we know where the source of our strength comes from. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, today what I want to do is I want to define some glossary of terms that Paul uses. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give you this review point. Four or five times in this passage of Scripture, Paul talks about us coming against. And he uses the term wrestling to talk about close quarter combat. And so, in your life, whether you want to realize it or not, as, as a born-again believer, whether you want to or not, you are going to come against forces of darkness. And I define this word against, it, it is the Greek word that is used in John chapter 1, verse 1, where it says that the word was with God. One translation says the word was face-to-face with the Father. 
So that's how close in spiritual proximity as we are walking by faith and we have forward movement by the leadership of the Holy Spirit who is leading us into the battle. He is leading us to confront powers of darkness. Can't avoid it. Can't hide from it. You're going to come up against it. And then Paul uses that word of wrestle, which is a, an old Greek word that is talking about combat arts. And so this is not just going to be a little sparring match. No, you're going to get engaged. And it's a fight for your spiritual life, a fight for your spiritual identity and destiny. But then he begins to outline for us what we're coming up against. And he, and he mentions certain classifications of the powers of darkness. And one thing you note right away is he talks about a hierarchy here. So it's talking about an illegitimate form of government that the enemy has established. And he's not the originator of anything. What he's tried to do is he's tried to mimic and he's tried to... Uh, in some ways set up another kingdom that would mirror the kingdom of God and the way God structured his government. And so when we talk about archangels and we talk about angelic hosts, things like that, we will also see that the hierarchy of satanic power that is mentioned in, in Ephesians chapter 6 mirrors and counterfeits the kingdom of God. Now, the first thing that I want to mention, and, and in different translations, these terms, there are different English words that have been used. Uh, so if you're reading the New King James or the New American Standard, the NIV, and so what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to use various words that will cover the majority of the translations. But the first one that he mentions is he said that we come against rulers. If you're reading or have the New King James, it is called principalities. And to define what a principality is, the word principality simply means that which is first, that which is principle or original, a principle thing, an original, a first or a main thing, a ruler or governor. And so you put all those singular words together and the nuance of them and you realize that this is the basic ruler that Satan has established in his hierarchy and it's probably uh, where more of those fallen angels are deployed. And when you look at it, it, it is that they rule over spheres of territory. Their assignment is over a region. Their assignment is over a nation. So when we talk about a principality, it's, it's the principal form, the original form that Satan has established that would reflect his ability to try to control the destiny of people, whatever nation they live in, the city they live in, the region that they live in. You say, well, Lynn, prove that, that these governing principalities are reflected in regions and territories and specific geography. Go with me, hold your finger in Ephesians 6, but go with me over the book of Daniel. And those of you that have let, read a lot of things about prayer and spiritual warfare, familiar passage of Scripture. And I'm going to give you just a little background, and I'm going to try to do it quickly because I want to cover quite a bit of ground today. We know that Daniel was reading the book of Jeremiah, and he realized that in Jeremiah there was a prophetic number of years that Jeremiah had seen about the Babylonian captivity. And Daniel, as he's studying the, the prophecies, he realized that they're coming close to the period of time where that prophecy of the restoration of the people of God being able to return to the land. And so he is seeking God and he's praying into these prophecies and he's trying to 
ask God to give him understanding because he's wanting to cooperate with what God is doing in his day. How I many you know we should be doing the same thing? We should be studying the word of the Lord and the prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled and not just read them for the sake of reading them for a mental understanding. There are promises that God is going to allow you and I to live in the days of their fulfillment. And a part of the fulfillment is that we get to pray into them to see them come to pass. And maybe even be players in the fulfillment of those prophecies. And so Daniel begins to pray and he's saying, he's crying out to God, God, give me greater understanding. And then there is this moment where um, after 21 days of prayer and fasting, Gabriel shows up to him and he says this to him. He said, from the first day, Daniel, you began to pray. God dispatched me to come and to bring you understanding. But he said, while I was being sent to you, there was a prince, a principality from Persia who came and resisted me. And then God dispatched an archangel, Michael, who came and did warfare with the prince of Persia and that brought breakthrough that allowed me to finally come and to speak to you and to give you understanding over what you're reading. Now, many of you have read the book, uh, This Present Darkness. How many of you have read that book? And it came out, what, 30 years ago. But I thought the book, This Present Darkness, was so captivating because it was like reading the book of Daniel, but the context was of a city that was in a church that was undergoing spiritual warfare. And so there was angelic activity and demonic activity, and there were principalities that were trying to maintain their control over this community. I wish the Lord would open up our eyes to see And that we could grow an understanding of, of the warfare that surrounds when we have a prayer meeting. Now, a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago already, I think it was, we've been doing a summer of, of monthly prayer meetings where we've been asking the church to come together and pray. Because we know that we're in a critical season in our nation. And we know the devil has a plan to destroy our nation, to divide it. But we also know that God has a plan of awakening and revival. I want to sign up for what God desires to see a harvest of souls. And I was in the Mario Murillo meetings for two of the nights in Eau Claire. And he said the greatest way to change a nation is to have people born again. And when they get born again, they then begin to have transformation in their mind. And they don't think selfishly. They begin to think kingdom. And when they begin to think kingdom, they get a kingdom value system. And normally, the way they vote aligns with the word of God. So the greatest way we're going to see a political shift in our nation towards a culture of life and not death, towards a culture of holiness and morality, not immorality, is we need to see an awakening occur that awakens the church to move into being harvesters and evangelizers that will go and see a tremendous harvest in our nation. That, that's God's plan. The devil's plan is to divide us, get us fighting and struggling with each other so much so that it, it stokes the fire of hatred and prejudice and ancient spirits that have been in this land all of a sudden resurrect and we find ourselves in the middle of a civil war where it's fought in, the, uh, in our streets and from block to block because it's not going to be just geographical like north and south. It's going to be fought in every major city. And I'm being prophetic this morning. So when we call the church together to pray, we prayed for our nation. We prayed for our government. We pray that God would bring peace, would bring stability in our times, that the church could do the work that it desperately needs to wake up and begin doing. And so 
I, I just happened to be out of town at a conference at the last one, but we had, we had chosen the prayer targets to pray for the election, to pray for the government, to pray for what's going to happen in the fall. And that week, President Trump, former President Trump, there was this assassination attempt. And at the staff meeting, I said, Micah, what happens if when we all get to heaven that the Lord reveals to us that that prayer meeting was strategic to save the life of a former president to keep our country devolving into conflict. And of course, when I said that, everybody thought that I was joking and that we all chuckled that God could use a little group of saints in La Crosse, Wisconsin to change the course of a nation. You know what? We've got to get over this thing of where we're so familiar with ourselves I'm not saying that we were the prayer meeting, but it could have been a little cottage prayer meeting there, a little church prayer meeting here. It could have been a little prayer meeting in a house between three or four people. And God used the collective of all those little prayers of those saints to save our nation from disaster. Do not minimize what you're doing in any way. Only heaven knows the power of prayer. If you've let, read Reese Howell's Intercessor, you know that that little prayer meeting that was happening with that little collection of saints changed the history of what was, what was occurring in World War II. I believe the Battle of Britain was decided by Reese Howell. I believe the Battle of Stalingrad was decided by revelatory spiritual intelligence that God gave that group of intercessors. And the Battle of Stalingrad was decided. And if you know anything about history, it looked like the Battle of Britain was going to be lost. Britain was going to be overwhelmed. It looked like the Russians could not hold out at Stalingrad. But somehow, somehow, and it was because a group of intercessors were, were getting discernment for the Lord and they were strategically giving government officials information that the natural intelligence services were, that intelligence was not being collected by them, but they were getting it from heaven and they were praying it and they were sharing with it and God changed the course of history. I'm not again speaking German, but I'm glad I'm not speaking German today. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm glad that, that this church is open today to preach the word of God and to have the freedom of worship, that it's not some type of a form of Christianity that's distorted around a political party called the Nationalist Socialist Party. We take many things for granted because you don't feel you're powerful, and you are. Yeah. You are. You are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Jesus did not raise from the dead just to give you a demonstration of God's power. It said that he manifested the resurrection life of himself. It was demonstrated, it was exhibited towards those who believe so that you would have confidence and reliance upon the power that he's put inside of you as you're coming against the powers of darkness principalities. So let's read this. Then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for the first day that you set your heart to understand and you humbled yourself before your God. Your words have been heard and I have come because of your words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. This was not a natural man. This was a spiritual being entity, but he was a principality that had a sphere of influence over the, the nation of Persia. He withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, I want you to say that with me, chief princes. Archangels are like chief principalities, chief rulers. And he came to help me, for I was there, for I was left there with the kings of Persia. So I believe principalities, they issue assignments, assignments against the church, assignments against a city, a region, a nation. They direct local warfare. There is another book I want to recommend that you read, and this dates me and ages me. 
but some of you are as old as I am, okay? <laughs> Terry Law, uh, a precious brother in the Lord, many years ago, and he was a missionary evangelist, but he wrote a book called The Power of Praise and Worship. Anybody remember that book? Okay, pull it back out. Refresh yourself in it. You go, I sold it in the room and sold it. Well, you can still get it on Amazon, okay? But in that book, he was ministering in Brazil, and he talked about how one of their teams was ministering in a community where on one side of the street, it was Brazil. On the other side of the street, and it was like a common marketplace. On the other side, I believe the nation was Uruguay. But, but two nations divided by one street, one common market. And he talks about how their team went out to evangelize in that market. The Brazilian church was in the midst of a great revival. And one of the things that they were growing in, in their understanding, was the, the power of praise and worship. Praise and worship is a delivery system for the weapons of our warfare. Terry Law used to describe it. He said, uh, uh, our praise and worship is like the, the rocket. It's like the ICBM. But what we're delivering is a warhead of the word of God, the, the warhead of the blood, the warhead uh, of, of the weaponry of our warfare that's not natural. And he said, but praise is the ability to, to release it into the atmosphere. Again, Many of us come to church on Sundays and we think that we're going to go through a song list and we do not deploy or employ ourselves to be a weapon of war. Your mouth is a powerful weapon when you allow the Holy Spirit to inspire your singing. Your heart becomes a powerful weapon as you begin to express the emotions of God, how God feels about this city, how God feels about people in this city, what God feels about the body of Christ. And when we begin to connect with the heart of God and the mind of God, and we begin to form with praise and worship, not only declaration of who God is, but what he is making us to be in him, it becomes a powerful weapon that God uses to weaken principalities and powers. That's why you can come in here and you can, you can have this, this tremendous uh, war game going on in your brain. And you can be disturbed emotionally and down and don't think that there's much hope. And you go, okay, I'm just going to take one for the church team today. And I'm just going to show up. Don't feel like it. Don't want to be there. Some people are there that I don't want to see. I'm glad two people chuckled. Come on now. All of us have been there. But it's amazing when we begin to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courtroom in praise and you begin to taste of the Lord and he begins to say, I'm still good. My mercy still endures. My covenant with you still stands. My promises, you begin to start singing about the promise of God and you understand that they are yes and amen in him. You begin to describe his nature, his character, the beauty and the glory of our king. We begin to sing of his excellencies and his love. Then the chemistry of my heart begins to change and thoughts that were strongholds and imaginations that, that were blinding me. The illusionist had blinded me to see the truth of the kingdom of God. Strongholds start coming down and I get a glimpse of the glory of the Lord and my heart changes, my thoughts thoughts change, and I leave here differently than when I came in. That's the power of praise and worship. We have the opportunity. The enemy wants to discourage us, take courage out of us in obedience, perseverance, and steadfastness. No, I want, I want today, after the church is assembled today, and we come in agreement with the word of God and we declare the glory of God through praise and worship, I want the enemy to be discouraged. I want him, that principalities, that issue, issues assignments and directs local warfare. I want him to say, 
we are in trouble in zone F. Whatever zone that he has us zoned at. Uh, we are in trouble in the Cooley region. We are in trouble in the state of Wisconsin. We, we are in real trouble because there are believers that are actually starting to believe what the Bible says. There are people that are actually starting to walk out in radical obedience the call of God upon their life. They're actually coming together in the unity of the Spirit, bonded by the shalom of God. These people are actually starting to believe. They are not consenting to the illusion of darkness, but they believe that they're a part of a kingdom of light. That they believe that his government, the government of their king is increasing and that, that, that there is going to be awakening revival. Man, when we come together in that way, we will weaken his ability to control what happens here. Now, I'm going to finish by talking about Terry Law. Terry Law said their team went in there. The Brazilian church was growing, growing rapidly, not only in numbers, but in spiritual maturity, and they got a revelation about praise and worship. They still do. Man, I tell you, some of the things that God is doing in Brazil is profound. But he said that the Brazilian church had understood the power of praise and worship and the fruit and effect of it in spiritual warfare. So as their team was ministering to people that were in the marketplace on the Brazilian side, they were, they were amazingly open to the gospel. And this was an evangel. You know how uncomfortable it is to do street evangelism. Unless you're just an extrovert and you're a high eye and you're the life of the party and you see any human being that is breathing and you want to talk to them because you think they're your, they're your best friend. I just love those type of people, don't you? <laughs> And when you're doing street evangelism, you want one of them on your team. But for most of us, when we come to do street evangelism, you, you, you know, you're trying to, how do I introduce myself? How do I engage them? How do I strike up conversation? How do I not come off weird, right? And uh, we stumble and bumble sometimes through it. And can I pray for you? What? What? What do you want to do? Pray for me? Uh, and they normally will say, yes. And you go, okay, can I put my hand on your shoulder? No, I thought you were going to go someplace and pray for me. You know, so you have this different cultures and, and spiritual backgrounds. But he said people were strangely warm to the gospel. And so a number of people came to Christ right there while the team was sharing. They said that we, they walked across the street and the church in Uruguay was weak, didn't have a revelation of spiritual warfare, the power of praise and worship, and they said just didn't look any different. Shops, marketplace, shops, marketplace, walk across the street, and they said it was like walking into a steel curtain. The people not only were hardened, but they were reactive to the gospel. They were hostile to the gospel. And he said, you would not think that that was naturally possible, but he used that in the book, giving you an illustration of how principalities have spheres of influence over nations. And he said the church in Uruguay had not matured enough to know how to do battle in the heavenlies to weaken the power of the principalities that were assigned in that region, but the Brazilian church had. Sometimes we wonder why, why are people so hard in the Cooley region? We're going to look at it in just a minute and I'll finish there. I want to give you a definition of what a power. Whenever you read in the Bible about principalities, you always see kind of this conjoined use of this couplet. Principalities and powers. You go, what's the difference the word power is the Greek word exousia, and what it means 
it means that it's not related to geography or a defined sphere of authority that is specific to a region or a land. It's talking about an influence and ability. Some biblical scholars said, uh, uh, say that it relates to the energy or the power of that being. And so principalities are the ones that assign the assignments. They're the ones that say, this is how we're going to wage war. The power is in partnership with, with, with geographical principalities, but they are the ones that bring abilities, energies, and powers that are trying to influence the mind and hearts of the people that they want to have domination over. So if I mention San Francisco, California, what is a power that is at work there? It's the power of, the, of a spirit of perversity and immorality. That land is marked by that power. And its energy has influenced the inhabitants of that city. I think that if you went to Washington, D.C., many Christians that go there, they say there is a political spirit that is tangible there, that it is divisive and that it's rooted in an arrogance and a pride because my way is right. We know that there are religious powers. We know that there are spirits of unbelief. There are spirits of, and powers of poverty that mark lands. And you can see the fruit and effect of a principality and power in how they bring the dominance of a certain influence, energy, and power to that area. It's important that we ask God to discern what are the influences over the heart and minds of the people that live in this valley? Can you say amen? amen. Now, I want us to go to, and we're going to finish here, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. While you're turning there, Paul goes on to describe rulers of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. And as you read the text, you realize what he's saying, local, and then just as there are angels, but there are also archangels, you realize that Paul is just describing arch principalities and arch powers. Chief principalities and chief powers. He's describing that they're the ones that have rule over all the principalities and powers. Again, it's a hierarchy. It's a government structure. He uses different ways to express it, but he's really just talking about when he talks about rulers of this age, spiritual wickedness in high places, he's just talking about the, the overall authorities over that hierarchy of principalities and powers. Paul said this, in verse 3, he said, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age or the world has blinded. Everybody say that word with me, blinded. You know, different words for blindness in the New Testament. The one that is used here is one that would be like temporary blindness. It's not like somebody that is born blind that they cannot see at all. This is like being caught in the fog of war, me driving through a fog bank. It is temporary blindness, which should give us hope. Veils can be torn. Smoke screens of illusion can be removed by the wind of the Spirit. Sometimes I just enjoy watching nature, and I, you know, I'll watch a storm or I'll watch a clouds and I'll just stare there and watch as wind and currents just carry them over you in a way. The wind of the Holy Spirit can remove the veils and remove the fog 
and the blindness that is created by spiritual darkness that wants to blind the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Now, God has commanded the light to shine. So has God done for us in the person and the face of Jesus Christ, has God done what is necessary for the salvation of people? Yeah. The light is shining into the darkness. So the enemy wants to use veils. He wants to use the fog of spiritual warfare and deception to blind their minds. It is the church's responsibility to tear the veils away and to, to partner with God in seeing the, the illusion and the deception of the powers of darkness removed so they can see the light. Now, this is what we're going to press into ne next week. There are four key words in the New Testament that expose the strategy and also the battlefield where the enemy is wanting to choose to fight. If you know the laws of warfare, you know every general that is leading an army, he wants to choose the battleground that he will, that he fills, gives him the greatest advantage to fight. If I ask you the question, what is the battlefield where the enemy has chosen to fight this fight? It is the battlefield of the mind. So these four words, and I'm going to go through them quickly. Paul describes Ephesians 6, 11. If you're taking notes, you can write them down, but we're going to unpack them next week. He talks about schemes, or in King James, wiles of the devil. <laughs> okay? He talks about, in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, devices. Paul, in Ephesians 4, 27, says, give no place to the devil, Opportunity, one definition of this in the Greek means a licensure. I'm granting a license, an opportunity. I'm saying you're permitted to operate here. So he talked about schemes of the devil, the vices of Satan. He said, give the devil no place, no license. And then in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, he talks about strongholds. And we'll see that this is progressive. Once the enemy deploys a scheme, he will then use devices to gain a license to build a stronghold. That's the way I want to put it. Schemes that allows him to deploy devices to seek a license so that he can build a stronghold. And we're going to look next week at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Even if he's successful to build a stronghold. And somehow his scheme has worked. His device was deployed and he gained license. Paul tells us that the weapons of our warfare, stand with me, the weapons of our warfare are not natural but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So even though his device, his schemes, we give him opportunity, even if it's a fortified place of a lie and a deception, we cannot say that he's won the victory because our weapons destroy strongholds. So some of you today say, I think I lost the battle. Because I feel that there is this stronghold, this fortified place, and I've not been able to overcome it. I've not been able to be successful. I want to encourage you, no matter what stage of the war game you're in, even if the enemy feels like I've gotten the place, I've secured it, and I've fortified a stronghold, God has weapons to destroy even the greatest of strongholds. I ask you to stand up, would you? Normally, people jump up in this church when I say stand because they know the long message is over. But you guys just sat there so compliant. Wow, thank you. How many are ready for strongholds to come down? Yeah. Wow, we sound like a partially victorious army.
you know, I've already preached it, but I felt like how the Lord wanted me to speak this today, and I'm going to pray it today. Is I just feel like the enemy has tried to so disqualify and disempower so many of you to think that your prayers really don't have any significance, importance. Yeah, 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 I'm part of the army of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard it all before, Lynn, but I feel very weak and powerless. I feel like the Lord wants to restore your confidence, not in yourself, but in him, the one that is in you. And you know it, and I know it, because the word says it, greater is he that is in you. Can we all say that one together? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so, Father, I thank you for the body of Christ. I thank you for every member in particular. I thank you how you have placed us in the body in a way in which you receive the greatest pleasure. And I know the enemy would want to nullify and disqualify our place and our purpose and our value and our meaning in your plan to use your body to fill everything everywhere, to bring a revelation of Jesus and all of his majestic splendor to every nation of the earth, every city, every town, every village, every institution, every sphere. Lord, I just thank you that all the nations will know, all the nations will sing, your word says. They will join in the chorus that Jesus is Lord that Jesus is king and the reward is for us that already know that and are experiencing that. But we want to be filled with your fullness. We want to be filled with your spirit. Today, we ask that you would fill us again with your spirit. One baptism of the spirit, but many fillings. Fill us again. I ask, Lord, that there would be a baptism of boldness, a baptism of the spirit, an infilling of the Spirit that allows us to know the power of the Lord and the strength of His might. And that we walk out of here not, not uh, you know, falling forward, just saying, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it, but God, we walk out of here filling you encourage us, filling us with a boldness and a courage and a power that says, I am in the army of God. And that he's clothed me with his own personal armor from head to toe. And that he's given me weapons of warfare that are mighty through him. And that there is nothing that is able to stand against the militant prevailing church of God. Lord, for those of us that live in Minnesota and Northeast Iowa and Western Wisconsin, we believe that you have marked this region for revival. You have marked us for a great awakening. You have marked us. You have marked the body of Christ and we understand the intensity of how the enemy has tried to divide and to destroy and to distort that to where we wouldn't even believe that it could be possible. But we say today in agreement that all things are possible with God. We say today that it is not going to be by might, not by power, but it will be by the Spirit of the living God. That God will do it and we will give Him glory for it. But we say, Lord, here we are, send us. Here we are in our brokenness and weakness with our history, our past. We say, Lord, in our present moments, all that we are, God, you know it. You know it all. You know our story. You know our successes. You know our failures. But we give it all to you, God. We lay it all at the, the, the feet of Christ, at the feet of Jesus. And so whether it's a crown or whether, whether it's our brokenness, God, we cast it all before you. And we believe that you can use it all. You can use it all. You can work it out for good and for your glory. 
So Holy Spirit, restore confidence right now to your people. Lord, we ask that you would anoint our mouth. Put a spirit of prayer on us. Spirit of intercession. Lord, I, I, I have loved reading Reese Howell's intercessor over and over again. And I'm moved. I'm moved by the, the spiritual things that you did in that intercessor. Not known by man, but known in heaven. Lord, I pray that that man, the anointing that that man had upon his life, Lord, we would say, would you, would you put the anointing of intercession like Reese Howell and the, the, that, that little small group of prayer partners and intercessors, we say, Lord, would you allow us to partake of that grace? Can you say yes to that? We say yes, Lord. We say yes to prevailing prayer, intercessory prayer that changes the destiny of nations. We thank you for it. Lord, we thank you, God, for the, the message that Terry Law lifted up in the power of praise and worship. God, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would take the truth that he shared in his generation 40 years ago through that book. God, would you enlighten our eyes once again to the power of our praise and worship. Lord, I ask upon congregations throughout the Cooley region, would you pour out a spirit of praise upon the congregations? Would you pour out your spirit that, that allows us to articulate genuine worship, worship that is spiritual and is based upon the revelation of truth of who Jesus is, not what we've made him to be in our mind, but Lord, by the revelation of the Spirit of God, reveal to us Jesus, Holy Spirit, in all of his majestic glory, and let our praise be appropriate to that. Lord, we're asking you. We're asking for discernment. We're asking, Lord, that you would give us spiritual intelligence to, to discern the powers that are at work in our land. Would you give us discernment that we would know how to begin to, to release the power of the Holy Spirit to displace that. Where there's poverty, let us release blessing in Jesus' name. Where there's religion, let us begin to embody incarnational obedience and radical lifestyle Christianity. Where's there, where there's deception, let us begin to be declares of truth. So we break off intimidation off of us. In Jesus' name. And we declare over the body of Christ that God has not given you a spirit of fear, timidity, but love, power, and a soundness of mind. We declare it and we receive this. Fill us today, Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen. Could I ask you to do it one more time and mean it? Amen. It means so be it. Do in us according to your word, Lord. Amen. We're in agreement with heaven. We're in agreement with your word. We're in agreement with your rule and reign, Jesus. We say amen. Now I want to release you with the blessing of you to raise your hands today. We just declare over you, beautiful body of Jesus. We say, may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord keep you. And may the Lord's face shine upon you. May you have eye contact with Jesus. May you experience the mercies of the Lord that are sure and tender every day. And may the Lord grant you his peace, his shalom his healing wholeness. And we ask this in the name of Messiah Jesus. And all God's people said, amen and amen.